Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday's Word. Uh, we're glad that you've tuned in. We pray that today's devotional will meet you right where you are in your walk, your life, what you're heading through today. It'll be an encouragement to you. Uh, we're continuing in our series on keeping your eyes on the prize as we look at Philippians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Philippians chapter 3. We'll be looking at a few more verses there as we uh, look at this great passage that has to do with symbolism, I believe, for a most part of that, how the Christian walk is symbolic in many ways to a runner running a race. That when a runner runs a race, he definitely keeps his eye on the prize. And there's some sacrifices that, that are made. There's some things that he has to keep his eyes focused on what the goal is. Not that our race is against everybody else. We're not trying to outrun our fellow Christian. Uh, we're not looking back. We're not looking aside. We're looking ahead because there is a prize that lies before us. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get right in. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just pray as we study your word, Father, you'd speak to us, Lord, God, right where we are, Lord. Your word's powerful, and we pray that it would just uh, penetrate our hearts and minds and forever change us, Father. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we've already looked. Our first point was that runners have to legally be in the race, and a Christian must be saved uh, to be in the Christian race. Uh, you know, it'd be a shame for a runner to run that race and finish the end and then be disqualified because he never really registered. He never really was officially in the race. And same way with a Christian, even more so, that he would end his life and see he was never really a runner because he had never got saved. He had never entered the race the right way. And uh, that would be the ultimate to, that you wouldn't want to hear is those words from Jesus that I never knew you. And so we need to be in the race. And, and being in the race, Paul, I believe, gives several things that save people that are in that race uh, would exemplify. And the first one, uh, he talks about rejoicing in the Lord in verse 1. That, hey, we, point number one is save people. Enjoy a relationship with Christ. We can rejoice in the Lord because we, we know him as our Savior. We know him personally. You know, it's not religion to us. It's a relationship. And so we can rejoice in that relationship with him no matter what happens we can cling to that uh, that we enjoy that relationship the, the second thing is that saved people uh, must be discerning we looked at verses uh, 1 and 2 there and also 18 and 19 we pulled that in a little early about all those verses that have to do with the saved person being discerning we've got to know truth from error we've got to uh, know what uh, church is preaching the truth and which one's not we, we need to be discerning on is that the Word of God? Does that match up with the Word of God? Is that what uh, the, the, the Lord says in His Word, or is it not? And so we've got to be discerning in our choices and in our decisions that we make personally and in relationships and, and in every kind of way to be discerning believers. So we looked at that in great detail. So we're on the third part uh, in verse 3, that saved people should worship God. Not only should they enjoy the relationship of Christ, not only they should be discerning, they did to worship God. Verse three, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God. And so what does it mean they're the true circumcision? Some of those false teachers were teaching that you had to be circumcised to be saved. And we know that's not true. There's, it's not of works lest any of us should boast. It's by grace. And so uh, they were trying to convince people you still have to be circumcised to be saved and and that's not the case the true circumcision is a circumcision that happens from the outside but happens in our heart you know that there's a heart change that we give our life to the lord and he changes us on the inside and that spirit comes to live within us so it's that's the true circumcision it's a heart one and we then we worship the lord in the spirit uh what does it mean in the spirit? Well, it's not ritual. Uh, as we said before, it's relationship because the spirit comes within us and we worship in the spirit. Jesus said we must worship him in spirit and in truth. We've already talked about the truth by being discerning where we want to know the truth. And now we're worshiping in spirit as well. 
because it's out of that relationship that we worship the Lord. Worship is not just singing. Uh, it's obedience. It uh, it's, has to do with trust and has to do with service and ministry. I mean, it goes on and on. It's not just uh, singing. Those things that we surrender our life to the Lord in worship, but it comes out of our heart, out of a spirit of love, out of a spirit that lives within us, not just not ritual and drudgery and all that. That's not not worship. And and so he he begins to with that one part because, point because that's so important that we really worship God from our heart. Uh, number four is that saved people should be humble and give God credit. He says in verse three, and glory in Christ Jesus, and glory in Christ Jesus. You see, uh, that word glory has to do with giving credit. It, it's bragging on Jesus. We live in a very braggadocious society um, where people are always bragging, you know, look what I did, look what I accomplished, look what I'll be able to do, look how much money I made, look what I own, and on and on and on. But if you realize you really can't brag on anything because we don't have anything that the Lord didn't give us. Uh, or allow us to have because he's the one that gives us energy and strength and wisdom and education, gives us a, a mind and all those things come from the Lord. And, and so all of our bragging needs to go to him, not us. It's okay to brag as long as you're bragging on the Lord, giving him credit, giving him honor, giving him glory and not ourself. You know, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. He knew he gave the Lord, the credit for anything that was in him that looked good or was accomplishable or uh, seemed to be going well, he gave the Lord the credit. We need to as well. Everything we have, we, we owe to the Lord. And, and that helps us in our relationship, realizing that, that uh, we brag on him. Uh, we give him the glory and not ourselves. The fifth one is that saved people should put no confidence in the flesh. Verse three, Put no confidence in the flesh. Um, we can say, hey, you know, I've been saved long enough and, and I'm smart enough and I'm educated enough and I've got enough experience. I can handle this and I can do that. And, and we, we can't enter in that realm putting all to, putting confidence in our flesh. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Jesus said in John 6, 63, in the spirit, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Paul said of himself in Romans 7, 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Nothing good in there. Only the good we have is Jesus. And um, in our flesh, we can put confidence in us, but we shouldn't. Uh, we can try to put confidence in it, but we shouldn't because as soon as we do, we'll find we'll fall. We don't have what it takes. We've got to have the Lord. And without him, we profit nothing. Uh, we don't have anything that's of value. And so we don't put confidence in our flesh. So those are some uh, five characteristics he gives of those saved people that are in the race. Then we're looking at how another point that runners, uh, regular runners, uh, they realize the principle of giving up to gain and the Christian runner should know that same principle. That there's things you give up as a runner. You may give up, uh, food that you love. You'd rather have a pizza and hamburger than, you know, broccoli and carrots that you're eating. And, you know, you'd rather be going to the movies when you have to say no, because you're still using that time for training and exercise. You know, you'd rather sleep in late, but you got to give up, get up early because you know you need that training. You'd rather have muscles that aren't sore, but you know you're going to have to have sore muscles to train. I mean, it goes on and on. You know, the give up to gain principle and the Christian runner should know that too. And, and, uh, and see that there are certain things uh, that we, we, we give up. And Paul kind of looked at his life and analyzed that as well. In Philippians 3, 4, it says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else had in mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. He said, when we begin to look at the flesh, what you can accomplish, what you can do on your own. He said, if that were the case, I could brag more than anybody uh, if I look at all of my credentials and all of my pedigree, so to speak, that I had in life. Um, basically, he's going to reflect on his life before Christ. Uh, if there was confidence in the flesh, he sure could do it. Uh, and then in verse 5 through 6, he ends up 
going over those credentials and pedigrees that he has to show that, you know, if he could put confidence, if there was confidence in the flesh, he could do it. But he's going to end up showing that there is no confidence in the flesh, no matter if you're even a, a Paul. Uh, the first one, you, you know, you, it, it's not about religion or ceremony or ritual. Uh, he says, hey, in verse five, circumcise the eighth day. In other words, I was Jewish born. I was starting the ritual outright by being circumcised on the eighth day. I was going by what the law said. And, and so, uh, you know, I start out with ritual and ceremony uh, to do it right. But that's, that doesn't uh, make you right. The other one is it's not about your race or where you're from of the country you're from. He said, of the nation of Israel, in verse five. That was uh, of the chosen people, God's chosen people of Israel. I'm from, I'm from there. That's my race. Hey, it doesn't matter your race. For whosoever will, let him come. And Paul was saying, hey, I'm, I'm not only started out uh, as a Jew with the right rituals, uh, I also was from the chosen people of Israel. That, that was where I was from. And then it, it has also nothing to do with your family status. You know, a lot of people think, well, look where I'm from or who my family lineage is and all that. Hey, it has nothing to do with that either because Paul goes on in verse five to say, of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, there was a lot of bragging rights to be of the tribe of Benjamin. And think about it, Benjamin was uh, one of the only two sons of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Uh, he was the only son born in the promised land. Uh, when the promised land divided his tribe, the tribe of Benjamin got the city of Jerusalem in, in their land. Uh, when the kingdom split under Solomon, there was only two tribes that were loyal to the divinic side, and that was uh, one of those was Benjamin. Uh, Mordecai and Esther were from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, the tribe of Benjamin had the best place of honor when the children of Israel went out to battle, according to Judges chapter five. Um, the first king of Israel was from the tribe of Benjamin, and it goes on and on. Uh, he could say, look where I was from. I was from this small tribe, but it's a very prestigious tribe. But that's of no value either. Uh, he could have said, you know, it's not about your traditions. He said in verse five, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews as to the law. Man, I was the Hebrew of the Hebrews. Man, I, uh, outwardly, he kept, you know, those traditions uh, with zeal and zealousness. And uh, he was trying to be the best Hebrew he could be. And so outwardly, people would see that, that he was. He would also say it's not about religion or religious position. In verse five, he said, as a Pharisee. Well, you can't get any higher than that. You know, that's the creme de la creme in the Jewish culture that a mom, a Jewish mom could only pray that her son would attain being a Pharisee. There were only 6,000 of them, a very small number. And this was very prestigious to be, if we're illustrating it as athletes, these were the, the superstars. These were the most valuable players in, 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 in at least that culture back then. These were the star athletes. And so Paul obtained that. He be, it became, and that wasn't easy to do, he, he became a Pharisee. And well, you couldn't attain a higher status there in that culture. And, but that was really uh, of no value when you look at the overall. And then it, it wasn't about your dedication or sincerity. You know, it says in verse six, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. In other words, he was zealous. He did what he felt like God wanted him to do. And to him, the Christian community was the opponent. And so he was taking them out, uh, feeling like he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was sincere about it and zealous about it. But look, you can be sincere and zealous and be sincere and zealous and be wrong, sincerely wrong. And he was um, because that wasn't God's will. But in his mind and because of the status he had achieved, he was even doing it with all his heart. And then also it had nothing to do with your self-righteousness in verse six, as to the righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. I don't believe Paul was saying he was perfect and didn't sin any, but he outwardly would appear in his self-righteousness trying to keep these rituals. He was doing a, a pretty good job. And so outwardly people say, man, that, that Paul's really doing it right. 
but that's just self-righteousness. You know, it's not perfection. We can't be perfect. Uh, that's why we need a savior so that we can go to heaven and um, be able to serve the Lord because we obtain his righteousness, it's not our own. So being able to try to fulfill all these laws and customs and traditions, that's not any gain really to that. And so all of that pedigree, all of that outwardness that people would look and admire and think, man, if anybody could be somebody, look at Paul. Man, he's got all the right credentials. Here's what he says about with all of that going on. In verse seven, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for the sake of Christ. <laughs> whatever was gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. That may have seen gain, but it really wasn't. Uh, and then he goes on in verse eight. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of, and then he lists what really gain is. Really those things I just mentioned, to him that was under the loss column. He gave that up because that was of no value to him really anymore. That was his past. He just gave that up, you know, that credential stuff. And then he really gained something really valuable is what he begins. He starts looking at the gain column, which when he looked at the gain column, the loss column didn't seem much at all. Uh, it says in verse eight, here's was his first gain. Surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Wow. All of that that he just mentioned, rubbish, trash. Just take out the trash. That was just rubbish. Why? Because he found the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. This word for value has to do with an incomparable value. You can't compare this value with anything else. Not what he just listed or anything else can compare to knowing Christ, the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Everything else was just dung or manure or trash to be thrown out in comparison to just knowing Christ. Well, do we value Christ knowing him? Remember we said before, I mean, a lot of us know Abraham Lincoln because we know what he did. We've read about it, but we never, we didn't know him personally. A lot of people know Christ because they've read about it, heard about it. You know, they know who Jesus Christ is, but they don't know, many of them don't know him personally. This is a personal knowledge. Do we treasure that? Even in the midst of what we're going through, maybe negative or difficult, we've got to do what Paul said. Let's reflect on what's really valuable, knowing Christ. All of that thing that he saw that he had, man, that was nothing now. He had a really great gain. On the gain column in life was him getting to know Christ. We've got to treasure that. We've got to value that above all things in our life. Because when we do, even what we go through negative, we can say, hey, but we know Christ. And that's far beyond any value of anything that I could ever possess that I personally know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for that great gain of knowing you personally uh, as our Lord and our Savior. And Father, we thank you for dying on the cross for us that we may know you and come to know you even more day by day. Pray for all those that have sounded my voice that as they're walking through their life, they'll be able to experience, we'll all be experienced just greater knowledge of you as we walk through this life and realize the value of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray that that was a blessing to you and I uh, just wanted to uh, be able to bring you that and uh, uh, just close out with just a few announcements. Uh, don't forget this Wednesday at Magnolia, we're cranking back up the uh, our youth uh, meetings on Wednesday night. It'll begin uh, tonight. Uh, seven o'clock. So if you got youth, make sure that you have them up here. And like I said, we crank that back up this Wednesday night at the Magnolia campus. Also, uh, we're having our clothing drive uh, here at the Magnolia campus, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, which would be the 20th. 
uh, from uh, 10 to 1. Uh, so we're mentioning it kind of early so you can be inviting people that you know could use that ministry uh, uh, as we um, have it uh, done and uh, use that as an outreach to our community. Don't forget also uh, for your uh, if you want your contribution statements, uh, you can email info at bfchurch.com, uh, info at bfchurch.com and put your name there because many times your name's not in your email and uh, let us know if you want us to email it to you or if you want it printed out, pick it up uh, the following Sunday. Either way that works well for you is fine with us. Amen. Uh, just want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Uh, all your prayers, uh, your support of the pastors, uh, it just means the world to us. And we can't thank you enough for your support, love, and prayers. Uh, uh, Satan comes against it, everybody, but uh, there's a lot of attack um, on pastors and, and God's leaders. So we appreciate your prayers in regard to that. And uh, just want to tell you, I love you, pray for you, uh, thank God for you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless.